These properties of the solution surfaces can also be proven analytically in a comparatively general setting, but I had not recognized the cusp phenomenon prior to production of these three-dimensional graphics. MC squared is interactive in another sense. It is designed to use the interactive graphics display to aid in the actual construction of the solution surfaces. We illustrate this capability now. This is a typical screen in AVS waiting to run the interactive code. There has been much recent interest in knot energies. One goal of knot theory is to detect equivalent knots. But if we take a complicated knot like this, it is hard to tell how we might simplify it. One idea, shown here, is to associate to every closed curve in space an energy and evolve the curve to reduce this energy. Our energy is like the potential energy obtained if we spread electric charge along the curve. Minimizing it makes the different strands repel each other. We corrugate the connecting strips between the guides and push the caps past each other. We twist the caps to undo the middle loops and push the equator across the sphere. Finally, we uncorrugate. Perhaps the best method for generating clouds is to use a fractal technique known as spectral synthesis, or Fourier filtering. The method uses an array of complex coefficients based globally on dimension, locally on frequency, and multiplied by a Gaussian random number. The array is then run through an inverse Fourier transform. Perhaps the best method for generating clouds is to use a fractal technique known as spectral synthesis, or Fourier filtering. The method uses an array of complex coefficients based globally on dimension, locally on frequency, and multiplied by a Gaussian random number. The array is then run through an inverse Fourier transform, generating an array of real numbers. These numbers are then interpreted as intensities. The blue background is made up of those values which are less than the median value. My program simulates the diver as a rotating body moving under the influence of gravity. Its rotational speed is controlled by the diver's position.
We calculate the angular velocity at each frame by finding the moment of inertia of the diver and then following the law of conservation of angular momentum. The program figures out how flat a dive is and then sets a splash height. The splash then moves under the influence of gravity. That was an under-rotated front two and a half in the tuck position. Here is a back one and a half in the pike position. A dive is controlled by setting the time points at which the diver starts changing position. Oops! Let's fix this dive. The problem was that the diver kicked out of the pike too late, so we must change that time point to an earlier time. So, we will set the lineup time slightly earlier. Here is the corrected dive. Now wasn't that better? The shadows cast by an aerial light source can be quite complicated. Let's look at the relatively simple example of a square light source and a square occluding object. Notice that part of the shadow is totally dark. This part, which is completely hidden from the light, is called the umbra. The other regions where some, but not all, of the light is blocked by the occluder is the penumbra of the shadow. To better see the structure of the penumbra, we can construct a diagram that divides the shadow into separate regions. From vertices of the light source, we project edges of the occluder down onto the plane. And from edges of the light source, we project through vertices of the occluding object. When we do this with all edges and vertices of both objects, the resulting shadow diagram shows us where different parts of the light source become visible or are hidden by the occluder. Let's take a closer look at the diagrams, this time from directly above. The light source and occluding object have been removed to give us an unobstructed view. As you may have noticed, the structure of the penumbral shadows is related to the structure of four-dimensional polytopes. In the case of the parallel rotating squares, the shadow diagram is the same as the projection of a four-dimensional hypercube. Let's remove the diagram. That wasn't easy to follow, was it? To figure out what's going on, let's look at something simpler. A circle. We'll build a vertical wall along the circle so that we can color the two sides differently. Can you gradually turn this circle into this other circle, where the purple and gold sides are reversed without creating sharp corners? Of course. I can turn a rubber band inside out. Remember, we're really trying to turn the circle inside out. We only built the wall so we could see the different sides. Oh, yes. The wall has to stay vertical, and it can't have creases, but it can pass through itself. Fine. Let me try. Watch out. That was a sharp bend. To see another one, we temporarily return to two dimensions. The top and bottom of the square connect as before, but this time the left and right sides connect with a flip. When the spaceship takes a trip around, it comes back upside down, but the second trip restores it to its original condition. Let's watch the trip again on the original square.
Before we visit another 3D universe, we'll look at the corresponding two-dimensional space. Its fundamental domain is again A square. This time we glue the left and right sides with a flip. This surface is called a Mebius strip. When the spaceship takes a trip around, it comes back upside down. The flip makes a difference in the shape of space. A second trip restores it to its original condition. Let's watch the trip again on the original square. Now glue the top and bottom of the square with no flip. Here's one from each set. We can change the projections so that they change roles. And the inside one becomes part of the torus on the outside. It looks like they intersect each other. Right. That happens when one of them is on top of the 4D polytope and the other one is on the bottom. They project to the same part of 3D. We can make that torus thinner and thinner. When we look straight down from 4D to 3D, the torus is flat. And all we can see when we look at the whole polytope is the top of the top facet of the middle set. Hey, we have all the vertices on the boundary of that projection. Yeah, but it's not that interesting because they all project to the same end vertices. To get them all to show up as different vertices, we have to change the polytope in 4D. We shift all the vertices just in their first two coordinates, keeping them lined up in facets the way they were before. Now we can see the top facet and the bottom one and all the ones in between. Now we turn the two caps in opposite directions because we want to convert the loop in the middle to twisting at the ends. Oh, I know. It's like a belt. If you put a loop in the middle and pull the ends tight, the loop turns into twisting. Right. Then you can straighten out the belt by turning each end half a turn in opposite directions.